Thank you very much uh, to the Talented 12 organizing team for inviting me to be a part of the 2021 class. I'm excited to be a part of this class. I'm very honored as well. I didn't expect air pollution to make a debut among this group, um, but I'm happy to represent our field. I will say that um, this title slide is a representative of my state at the moment. The background is Riverside, UC Riverside, and I just moved institutions this summer. Um, so I'm asking for your grace at this time uh, and patience with me as I'm moving through quite the transition. First and foremost, I want to acknowledge the people in my work, in my group. Um, without them, the last three years would not be possible. Um, Abby, Yvette, Khan, Jennifer, E, Alex, and Andrea. Um, I would also like to highlight the fact that my group, uh, we prioritize inclusion, diversity, and equity. And um, we are a great team. Um, and that builds on the principles of uh, workmanship and uh, being a good team player. And I'll take this time also to thank my graduate mentor, Professor Armistead or Ted Russell at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Without his initial support in my career, um, I wouldn't be here today. I'd also like to thank my postdoctoral advisor, Professor Heather Holmes, now at the University of Utah. At the time I worked with her, she was at the University of Nevada, Reno. She has also been a force uh, in my career, um, and I, I attribute much of my early success to them. So thank you to my group and thank you to my group members. We are the Air Quality Modeling and Exposure Lab. So I'm also uh, front-loading acknowledgments as well, because this work doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, I have quite a few collaborators, both in the academy and also uh, in the community organizing space and in the community college space. In particular, the People's Collective for Environmental Justice, my friends and colleagues, Chella, Jean, Andrea, Anthony, and so many more. My colleague, Heather Smith, at the Riverside City College campus, um, and also to the community college students that helped launch the work that has, uh, I think, gotten the attention of CNN Magazine. So I just want to thank all of those people, and I want to thank the sponsors for supporting my work. I know most people have a, a, quite a bit of bio. I'm sorry I won't be able to present that today, but I hope to give you a rich understanding of the um, motivations for the work that we're doing um, in the ACML group. And so this is just an overview of the thrusts that are currently um, being undertaken in ACML. And so thrust number one, I'm very excited about. It's um, work at the intersection of human uh, interactions and air quality uh, exposure disparities. This is a very hot topic at the moment. So this, uh, this thrust of research allows me to interface with sociologists, um, experts in the humanities, and as well as social justice. So I'm really excited about the work we're able to do along thrust one. And thrust two, three, and four are what you would expect more from an air quality modeler, uh, which is my background, uh, where we are looking at research at the intersection of air quality and meteorological studies, as well as uh, transportation, sustainability, and mobility. Um, and more recently, we have been uh, embarking on work related to uh, computational methods. So <laughs> I'm a little bit of the odd man out. <laughs> um, I will talk about the principles behind the work that I do. So I like to start off with the definition of air pollution engineering as I see it. Well, in high school, I was taught this uh, definition by uh, Dr. Douglas Edwards, um, who was a proponent for introducing young black students to engineering very early on. And um, I wanna thank Dr. Edwards at this moment, um, uh, who was my uh, engineering instructor at Westlake High School in Atlanta, Georgia. So he taught me that engineering is the application of math or science to design or improve useful things. And so I applied math and science concepts to help improve air quality. 
So I consider it to be air quality engineering. Um, this little video here is just showing the evolution of air pollution over the southeastern United States. And embedded within this model are the physical and chemical principles that my colleagues in the cohort are talking about today. So this is just the expansion of those principles to understand air pollution and its evolution over space and time. And more recently, and more uh, a little bit more excitingly, uh, I've been able to leverage the Internet of Things and wearable air pollution technology, in my opinion, to solve grand challenges related to air quality to this day. And I'll talk about some of those grand challenges here in just a second. So upon uh, arriving at UC Riverside, which is in Southern California, it is in the desert, um, I came to learn about several air pollution exposure disparity issues. Um, it was very sad to see. It was my first time really seeing such, uh, such tough and uh, harrowing experiences of the people that live in this area. And so what you're seeing is on the bottom left is a map of the communities that have been designated as being disproportionately exposed. And um, they're formerly known as 8617 communities. The San Bernardino Muscle community is the community that I am engaged with most because it's close to UC Riverside. I develop close relationships with those community organizers and I'm also on the technical advisory group. And so what you see on the right are the identification of community concerns. And so what this tells us that community has a rich knowledge of what's going on in their neighborhoods in regards to air pollution, water pollution. And this is a program, this AB 617 program facilitated um, very symbiotic work to reduce their air pollution exposure disparities. And so I'm just gonna move forward here. This AB 617 program inspired me to look at how mobility may impact air pollution exposure disparities. And so a lot of people are familiar with uh, this study. If you're not, we uh, work together with community to monitor their personal air pollution exposure by using IoT enabled wearable sensors. And we collected over 900,000 data points from a, a small subset of people. This was a pilot study. And through the power of uh, GIS technology, we were able to cluster these space-time transects and classify the microenvironments to be able to understand how much time people were spending were and what their exposures were. And not, not surprising, we found that exposures were quite diverse across a number of different microenvironments. And what we found is that the home microenvironment was the most, uh, was more exposed, was uh, created more uh, adverse exposures for the San Bernardino participants compared to our higher income participants. And so I'm telling you guys about this pilot study because it's actually launching another effort to harness the, the power of Internet of Things and wearable technology to be able to uh, characterize these exposures at um, larger scales and to be able to inform policy interventions uh, that may uh, reduce the uh, exposures in places that we really haven't been paying attention to. And so one of these expanded studies is our 2021 community air grant that is being uh, uh, carried out at UC Riverside under the leadership of Ms. Yvette Torres, who is a powerhouse in the Inland, in Inland Empire community. She is leading this grant to, we want to empower our community residents with their own data. They will have data sovereignty over their daily exposures to understand how they are moving throughout their community and where their hotspots are. But mind you, this comes at the heels of a large base of community knowledge about the BNSF rail yard that is um, overpowering this community at the current moment. And just for uh, a, a little taste of what we're doing, um, some of the more, uh, uh, the future plans that we have at Berkeley, we're gonna be looking at also how to harness uh, personalized data to understand where the communication breakdowns occur when it comes to wildfire exposure risks. So the hypothesis that we put forth is that if people have access to their own personalized data, 
um, they may be more likely to uh, make substantial changes to reduce their own exposure risks. And people may say, well, why don't we have policy to protect people? But the work that I do is meant to put the power in the hands of individuals in the event that policy cannot catch up as fast as it needs to. Last but not least, we are also making strides along the computational front where we uh, want to harness the, the power of graphical processing units, which is advanced computational hardware, to potentially enhance our traditional air quality modeling uh, computational efficiency. And with that, I want to thank uh, once again my group. That is our 2021 photo. Uh, we are hybrid. We are across two campuses. It's actually, we're in three places because Abby's in Georgia. Um, please feel free to interact with my website at the QR code, as well as my podcast, where you can hear a little bit about the under, under the hood of academia, especially for my scholars that are people of color. Thank you very much, Towns, as well, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Sunny, for telling us about this work. Um, I wondered, uh, obviously, I think all of us in the last year and a half have thought a lot about um, our exposures in terms of infectious disease. You know, do you think that um, the awareness is greater around just personal protection? I mean, you talked a lot about the idea of putting the power in people's hands. You know, what maybe you could give me your vision of what you think the world could look like if you had that data. <laughs> To be honest, uh, that vision looks a lot like Google Maps, so shout out to the scientists and engineers behind that effort. You should be able to pick up your cell phone and understand what your exposure variability will be from point A to point B. Um, this way you can advocate for yourself if you're being put into a situation that's gonna increase your exposures adversely. Um, I think everyone should have access to that, especially people that and communities that are disproportionately exposed. And I'll just ask briefly one other question, because you mentioned the idea that where you live seems to be the biggest risk factor in terms of exposure. Is that um, because of the environment outside of your household, or is it both things? Maybe you could give us a little more information about that part and, and how people will then be able to um, make decisions when they have that information. Wow, uh, Lisa, if we had an hour, I could go into it a little bit more, but where you live is a function of socioeconomics, uh, historical policies regarding redlining, um, uh, social mobility, which informs air pollution exposure. And there's a subset of people in my field that are realizing this and understanding how important it is to understand these structural and political um influences on where people are able to thrive <laughs> so uh i just say us as air pollution researchers especially exposure people we need to understand that these systems have uh, a pretty big impact on uh, whether or not people bring breathe clean air or or habitually dirty air well, I, we're so happy to have learned a little bit about your work today. Thank you so much, Sunny.